Hi there, friend. My name is John Werner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. On today's show, I have with me John Hagman. Uh, John Hagman is the author of The Bible's Hidden Treasure and is a biblical researcher. He is a certified health physicist with a master's degree in radiological sciences, and I'm looking forward to our discussion about faith and works. He also possesses the best first name on earth. So, John, welcome to the show. Oh, (laughs) thank you, John. Yeah, it's a good name. Yeah, you can't beat it as far as I'm concerned. It's uh, the second most common in the world, I believe. Um, So I'll take it. Um, John, how, how did you interact with spirituality or Christianity the first 18 years of your life? Well, I was uh, raised in a Catholic family, and uh, we went to church every Sunday and every holy day of obligation. And when I was about 18 years old, uh, give or take a little, um, I got uh, a little tired of the ritual. Uh, the you know Every year you could tell what the gospel was going to be uh, because they repeated them every year and uh, wasn't getting a, a whole lot of um growth out out of the catholic church you know it was when i started out it was very ritualistic uh you know in latin uh the priest had his back to you most of the time and then they they changed halfway through and turned the altar around or put the priest on the other side of the altar and uh started uh, talking in english more and uh, so it it was uh a little bit of improvement, but uh, again, the the ritual just uh, really didn't suit me. And so I basically stopped going to church uh, around 18 years old and didn't really uh, continue going back to church until I uh, was married at at about the age of 32. Gotcha. That's a pretty uh, large gap. Did you, did you, kind of identify as an atheist or anything like that or did you just say "Eh, i'm catholic and and just kind of shrug it off no i i identified uh, i guess more as an agnostic uh, someone that says i don't really know if god is real or not but uh definitely was never an atheist um there was nothing that uh drove me to to say that god does not exist Uh, but i didn't know for sure uh, didn't have have much uh, much of an opinion about it at all. Gotcha. Okay. And and not having much of an opinion at all. I I assume you weren't really interested in other faiths or anything like that. Uh, no. I, I I studied a little bit of philosophy uh, by reading a book one time, and uh, that was interesting. You know, looking back at how uh, Aristotle and Plato looked at uh, the world and you know there's a a lot of uh, commonality between uh, just being a good person and everything that's in the bible and and philosophy in general Uh, but then as philosophy got closer to the 20th century uh, a lot of the philosophers uh, like Nietzsche were saying uh, you know God is dead and there is no God and uh, and that's kind of when I got disinterested in uh, studying philosophy, but uh, I was also on my career path at that time, and uh, so I was really focused on on my career more than uh, religion, uh, for sure. Gotcha. That makes sense, especially for that time period of life, um, to be kind Mm -hmm. of focused on that. Uh, How do you view your faith now, or, or what's the biggest difference between maybe your pre-18 faith and the faith you have now? Oh, well, right now, my my faith uh, is unshakable. Uh, nobody uh, in this world could convince me that uh, God does not exist. And um, 
it, it was kind of a gradual process. Uh, it started uh, when I married my wife, and, and uh, she was a Methodist. And interestingly, she was raised a Catholic also, but uh, then switched to the Methodist religion because her father used to be Methodist and her mother was Catholic. And but uh, so we went to the Methodist church. And, and uh, one of the things that I noticed when I was going to church with her is that uh, the Methodists love to sing. I think the expression is uh, Methodists are going to sing their way into heaven. And uh, and I found the, the songs uh, moving, although I can't sing. I just don't have a voice for that. But um, I could feel something, uh, you know, a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling uh, when we were singing the songs. And uh, but of course, that was just temporary during church and nothing much changed. Uh, changed other than, uh, yeah, I kind of like going to church. That was a nice thing. But uh, the real change uh, came after we had two young girls, and we decided to send them to a Christian school. Uh, My wife was very intent on that, and I thought it was a good idea that they should have uh, 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 probably a better schooling than than in the public school and certainly have uh, an introduction to who God is. And uh, that was in uh, 1998, and part of the of their work at at the Christian school was to study the Bible. And being a good Catholic, uh, they never read the Bible, and I had never really read the Bible. And uh, so I wanted to help them with their homework, and so I started reading the Bible. And and I didn't read it like most people, uh, you know, start at the beginning and and go straight through. Well, I, I started reading it like a research scientist and, and analyzing it. And um, this uh, book that I recently read uh, talked about uh, a horizontal reading of the Bible, where you'd read um, the, the three different, three or four different stories about uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And you could see that there were clearly contradictions uh, although they may be somewhat unimportant and possibly explained easily. Uh, but uh, being a scientist, I just didn't really like uh, having contradictions. And what I was told was, you know, the perfect word of God. Uh, for God to be perfect, he cannot contradict himself. And uh, one of the things I learned later, when we talk about it later, is the the principle or the the law of non-contradiction. And as a scientist, that really upset me. And yeah, contradictions, minor contradictions, like how many people saw Jesus uh, during the resurrection, that didn't bother me as much. But there were contradictions in what it takes to be saved, what it takes to go to heaven. And uh, and I certainly uh, wanted to know that. And and while I was doing this this study early on of the Bible and and finding these contradictions, uh, it was it was uh, very trying on me, uh, very confusing. And uh, we, my wife and I, signed up for a Bible study class, and and that helped a little. But the the more I studied, the more I, I kind of stopped looking for contradictions. And I said, well, what is consistent in the Bible from the beginning to the end? uh, Where are there no contradictions? And that's when I I started focusing on uh, basically the the book of James, uh, which is consistent with a lot of the Old Testament, and Job, which has a a lot of good lessons in it, uh, has a lot of... uh, consistency, and it has uh, at least nine chapters in it that deal with lies about God. And and that was kind of revealing. You know, why, why would the Bible want you to know lies about God? Well, if you look at these lies that are told by uh, Job's three friends, and they were telling lies because they wanted Job to uh, curse God to his faith. And then if you start comparing their lies 
to other parts of the Bible, including the New Testament, you'll see, well, they're saying the same thing, maybe in slightly different words, but you can start spotting the lies about God uh, by looking at the, the chapters in Job that you know they're lies about God. And so, again, after a great deal of research, uh, I found what, to me, is the truth about God, the truth about how we're going to have uh, salvation, how we're going to get to heaven. And uh, that gave me a great deal of comfort. And, and it also uh, made uh, started making sense, uh, logical sense, as to what is in the Bible. And there are tr the truth about God and there are lies about God. All you have to do is, is separate the two to be on the right path to go to heaven. Thanks for catching me up on that. Uh, two things. One, I think it's funny that you've pointed to both the Job and James, because when I was a Christian uh, and studying the Bible, you know, uh, especially young people, they like to do these like, what's your favorite book of the Bible stuff, which I always kind of rolled my eyes at because that seemed uh, kind of silly based on what we were doing. But uh, favorite New Testament book was James and favorite uh, Old Testament books was Job. Um and uh, my reasons for that at the time, I believe, were that Job felt like the most real book of the Bible. Maybe I'm just a pessimist, um, <laughs> but I was like, yep, that's life. Every, you, you know, he'll lose everything and and your friends uh, to give you bad advice, uh, which is kind of pessimistic, but but it felt like very um, relatable. Um, and then James, I liked because I grew up in a in a Protestant church that w was big time, big um put a big emphasis on faith alone and put a big emphasis on um on on good works being as filthy rags compared to god that kind of idea and uh mm. it really frustrated me because i felt like it was um not only wrong <laughs> um j just common sense wrong um but uh but really damaging to 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 how you shape your mind um, what, I, what I'd like to go into is, you know, you're talking about how growing up Catholic and then going Methodist. Uh, first question, do you identify as either Protestant or Catholic now, or do you kind of distance yourself from those, uh, terms? Well, um, being the, the, the whole Protestant movement is based on Martin Luther's, uh, Reformation proclamations that you're saved by faith alone. The Catholics, uh, they have fallen into that camp too recently. Uh, a lot of their more recent documents are that you are saved by faith and and not by works. And uh, so uh, I would call myself a Christian because I do honestly believe um, that Christ was and is God. He was God incarnate, God in flesh uh, here on earth. And uh, he was res resurrected. Uh, and since he was God, I, I like to say Jesus resurrected himself, uh, which uh, people take a lot of uh, offense against, but, uh, but he had to if he was God. And uh, I just am, am very comfortable calling myself a follower of Christ. Uh, don't really want to be identified as a Catholic. Um, one of the big reasons is is they pray to Mary, and and to me that's uh, the equivalent of idolatry, uh, and and they pray to their saints and their statues, uh, although they you know they kind of whitewash that, saying oh we just use that as a reminder, like Protestants have a cross up in front of the church to remind them who they are, but um, in a sense I I never want to pray to Mary again, but you know when I was growing up uh, you know every uh, 10 times you'd say the Hail Mary, and then you'd say one Our Father on the rosary. And so I, I don't identify as either one. I identify myself as a Christian. That's fair. I think uh, I would have felt very similar when I was a Christian too, even though I grew up very Protestant. Um, I, I, I did attend Mass for a bit when I was in college just because I enjoyed it, but I didn't partake of the Eucharist or anything. Um, and, uh, but mostly because I felt it would be offensive to Catholics, um, because I, I, I had very Protestant beliefs. 
Um, for the listener who might not know, here's where Protestants and Catholics Catholics are uh, most similar. Um, they both believe in a virgin birth. Um, both believe Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and that he'll come again. They both cite Jesus as the founder of their faith. Um, Catholics would make special mention of Peter as the first pope, while Protestants would make a more general claim that the apostles, including Paul, help establish the uh, early church. Um, both systems hold scripture as holy. Um, and with with most agreement in Old and New Testament, Catholics, uh, the Catholic Bible has a few more books than the Protestant one. Um, and uh, they both believe in the Trinity, meaning three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and one God. They both worship God on Sunday, typically, and they consider that day special, although, you know, almost to an individual level, it depends on who you talk to, how special. Um, they both put a lot of weight into marriage, um, though Catholics actually view it as a sacrament, um, which makes divorces a mm-hmm. little more taboo, uh, even though I would say in Christianity, divorce is taboo pretty much across the board. Um, both believe that sin came into the world through Adam. Uh, both believe that um, all the prophets of the Old Testament spoke truth, even wh- whether it's come true or not, it will in the future if it hasn't already. Um, and then both believe in original sin, meaning you're born a sinner. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Um, and they both believe that Jesus was God um, and the one and only true savior of humanity. And the reason I highlight those similarities is because um, they have a lot of difference that differences that you've alluded to, like praying to Mary. Um, uh, definitely in their architecture, um, in their services, and their sacraments, there's a lot of differences. Um, but probably the biggest philosophical difference that is sometimes highlighted is this whole faith versus works things. Um, uh, when, when discussing faith versus work uh, works, um, which just means good deeds or good behavior, it is important to keep in mind um, that there's varying interpretations of individuals um not just the larger umbrellas of it's it's not a matter of christian versus non-christian this is an internal conundrum within christianity uh and it's been contentious for a long time so we're probably not going to solve it here but we might as well give it a shot right so (laughs) with all this with all this in mind john uh can you summarize either scripturally or doctrinally or historically whichever way works easiest what this whole idea of faith versus works is? Yeah. um, The, the basis for being saved by faith alone, uh, that's primarily based on the writings of Paul and, uh, and, and the the letter of the two Hebrews, uh, which may or may not have been written by Paul. That's still in discussion, but uh, those are the prime basis for, uh, being saved by faith alone. And John has a lot of that too in, in his gospel, which uh, which is one gospel that's entirely different from the first three gospels, um, quite different. And then uh, that was these writings of Paul and Hebrews and John were taken by Martin Luther. And, and there he developed um, his reformation document that that says you know you are saved by faith alone and it's interesting that uh, when he was translating the bible from latin into german one of the places where paul was saying you're saved by faith uh martin luther inserted the word alone that was not in the original greek um which the the uh, new testament was all written in and so you know he was he was kind of fudging a little bit on on why you're saved by faith alone but on, on the contrary to that uh James in in his second chapter verses 17 through 26 he clearly says you are not saved by faith alone uh and the only place you'll see the words by faith alone are, are in uh, James and I've seen it several times where some author will try to say, well, you got to have faith so that your works are, are good, or if you have faith, then you'll do good works. But no, people don't have to have faith in God to do good works. And you take, a, for example, Buddhist monks. They lead a, a, a life of poverty. They lead a life of sharing and, and caring for their fellow, fellow, fellow man. And uh, and 
you know, they're very humble people. They, they are, uh, in a sense, following the teachings that, uh, that Christ taught. And so they have no faith in Jesus, no faith in God, but they are doing good works. And let me back up just a little bit. Uh, you said that um, uh, no one is righteous, no, not one, and, and your good works are filthy rags. Um, yeah, Paul says that, that no one is righteous, no, not one, and that's a lie because God twice says uh, Job is a righteous man, and Elijah was a righteous man. Elijah was so righteous, he went to heaven long before Jesus was crucified and died for our sins, and I put that in quotes. And uh, Enoch was a righteous man, and so you can have righteous people. And then when it comes to the our good works or filthy rags, that's a quote from Isaiah, and that is taken out of context. If you read the line before that quote, that, that our works are filthy rags, he's talking about sinners who are doing good works, and he's basically saying it's hypocrites. If you're a hypocrite, uh, a, a sinner, but you claim to be good, those good works are filthy rags. Yeah, hypocrites uh, are, are quite often condemned in the Bible and by Jesus. And so taking a quote out of context and making a false statement that no one is righteous, it really is uh, not fair to use those as uh, why you're saved by faith alone and not by your good works or a combination of faith and good works is, is really what it is. Yeah, two things. Uh, one, I definitely grew up hearing the whole, basically, if you don't have faith, your good works don't count or they're just part of God's common grace or, you know, some sort of workaround. Uh, because obviously, well, maybe not obvious. In my church, you know, we had the book of James and then we'd come to it, preach through it or something. And everybody just starts kind of looking around like, huh, well, this is pretty contrary to a lot of um, what we teach. Uh, so what do we do with it? And and you basically just have to make stuff up. I mean, <laughs> you just have to <laughs> to, to yes. make it work somehow. Um, I, I, I Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Martin Luther just remove the book of James? Didn't he didn't he call it uh, not the Bible? Well, uh, that's what he wished. But uh, I looked up a couple of quotes um, by Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther, uh, he did take issue with the book of James. He didn't think it was uh, expressed the nature of the Gospels uh, in, in his words. That's a quote from him. Uh, and appeared to, to contradict Paul's statements about justification by faith. And, uh, it, and then he also said that it didn't directly mention Christ, which, again, <laughs> is another lie written by a man. Uh, and James is mentioned twice uh, in his book, uh, first and foremost, right at the beginning in James 1.1, 1, 1, and, uh, and then in chapter 2, the first line, he says, uh, you know, he praises our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. So James not only uh, claims uh, Jesus to be God, our Lord, and and uh, so Martin Luther gets it wrong. And here, here's another quote. Um, he says, uh, therefore, St. James' epistle, his letter, is really an epistle of straw uh, compared to these others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. Well, that is not the case. Uh, you know, the gospel says, is, tells us to stop sinning, and certainly James does that. And in, and the Gospels tell us that we will be judged by God uh, when we when we die, and James says that too. And and if you do a cross comparison, uh, James is very consistent with what is in the Gospel. It's just not consistent with what Martin Luther wanted to emphasize in the Gospels to justify his case for you're saved by faith alone. And uh, as far as throwing it out of the Bible, it didn't exactly say that. Uh, Martin Luther said, we should throw 
uh, the epistle of James out of this school that he was teaching at, for it doesn't amount to much. It contains not a syllable about Christ, which again is wrong. He mentioned Christ twice. Uh, not once does is it mention Christ. And then he says, except at the beginning. So he missed uh, the second chapter there where it mentions Christ again. And then he goes on to say, I maintain that some Jew wrote it, probably heard about Christian people, but never encountered any. Well, James was a Christian by calling Christ Lord. So what else does that make you but a follower of Christ, a Christian? And he goes on, since he heard that the Christians uh, place great weight on faith in Christ, he thought, what a moment. I'll oppose them and urge works alone. This is what he did. And so Martin Luther is twisting facts, um, trying to uh, get his personal viewpoint across, which is not correct. And, and he discounts and, and omits things that are written in James. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm very um, adamant about is that, you know, Satan can get people to say lies. Uh, you know, the, the three friends of Job that uh, tried to tell Job how evil he was and, and how God was punishing him for all the evil that he did. Well, they were telling Job these lies uh, to get Job to curse God. And, you know, either they were making it up themselves or Satan, who had skin in the game, uh, you know, he wanted to, to win the bet with God that uh, Job would curse God to his face. And, and so who inspired these men? Were they self-inspired or did Satan inspire them to lie? And, and I think it's obvious that Satan can get people, inspire people to do evil things. I mean, who inspired Hitler to want to uh, kill all the Jews in the world? Who, inst who inspired Stalin to kill millions of people? Um, you know, who inspires the mafia to, uh, to, to be totally self-focused and, and material-focused, and, and regardless of how many people are hurt? And so Satan can inspire people. How do we know that Satan didn't inspire Martin Luther? because he's telling lies. And, and what is the, the native language of Satan or the devil? It's lies. That's his, that's his native language. And so I'm, you know, it, it, it makes people really upset when I mention to them, there are lies in the Bible and they go, no, no, oh no, it's the perfect word of God. And I said, well, what do you say about in Job, at, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of chapter 42 of Job, God says, hey, you three guys lied about me, talking about God. And, uh, and so they, they just kind of glaze over and, and act like they don't want to hear me anymore. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult task to try and convince people that, that there are lies in the Bible. Well, and just in case the listener is not aware, you know, uh, you and I could enjoy some good old fashioned Martin Luther bashing, I think, because uh, <laughs> he's he's definitely a problematic figure in history um, for, for various reasons. One, even from that quote you said, it sounds like there's some uh, anti-Semitism there a little bit. Um, and oh, yeah. and uh, that's been pretty well documented from him. Also, how he viewed uh, mentally ill people is not great. Um, so the problematic figure, but the way he was pitched to me growing up was he's still like the first mover of the Reformation movement, which is accurate. Um, I would definitely say Calvin was more, uh, the figurehead of Protestantism than Luther was because Luther was a little bit, he, he was a little more sympathetic to Catholics than I think people pitch him as, um, but, uh, yeah, being a former Catholic himself, yeah. correct, correct. So, 
Uh, but this is important to note that uh, one of the founders of, you know, where we get evangelicalism, evangelicalism is this, uh, most denominations in the U.S. are descendant uh, from Protestantism. So this is a important thing to note um, that that most churches in the U.S. Uh, are descended from from this guy. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean they believe everything he did, obviously. Um, but it's important history to note, especially when he is finding something in scripture that doesn't jive with what he's uh, teaching. And so he just goes, well, we shouldn't teach it. Um, that's pretty radical, especially if you're at the same time going to claim um, absolute authority of scripture. Um, so, so thank you for bringing that to light. It's also another thing you said, you know, in scripture, it seems that James argues um, that faith and works are the same thing, while Paul seems to argue something different. Uh, so you do you agree that there's like um, a disagreement between Paul and James, it seems? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you set uh, Paul and James in the same room together, um, that uh, they would have a heated argument that would never end. You could probably allow for a little bit of that. I mean, they're two humans who are allowed to have two different opinions. Um, but again, if you're pitching the Bible as, a, you know, inspired and errant holy book, that that's tough for me to wrestle with um to say they disagree that much yeah um in in my more recent research um i've completed uh, analyzing uh two books that that are kind of polar opposites are are you familiar with uh, uh dr bart ehrman uh I am. A theological professor i am okay yeah i i have finished reading his book, uh, Jesus Interrupted, and uh, it goes through uh, reporting all the, well, not all, but several inconsistencies, uh, contradictions in the Bible, although I think he tends to to look more at um, the numbers of things. Uh, You know, how many people saw Jesus at at the resurrection? Was it two women, a bunch of women, uh, you know, and, and minor details, but I focus on contradictions in in theology. Uh, the biggest one, are you saved by faith alone, or are you not saved by faith alone? And, and the other book that I've, I've finished researching, a grand book uh, by uh, David Le- um, Limbaugh, David Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh's brother, he wrote a book, um, Jesus on Trial. And, and it's really not about Jesus on trial, it's about the entire Bible and and his conclusion uh, that he supports with with many many quotations and and references from other uh, scholarly um, Bible analysts uh, is that every word in the Bible is the perfect and inspired word of God, and he just looking through it he totally ignores. Uh, James uh, chapter 2, verses 17 through 26. And and Ehrman, in his book, he, he concludes that each part of the Bible, each epistle, each gospel, uh, each book, is a standalone document. It, it, it represents what the author thought and, uh, and what he wrote down. There was not that much collaboration uh, between the different authors, certainly uh, spread out over time uh, between the Old Testament and New Testament. There couldn't have been much collaboration, but uh, certainly they cross-reference uh, each uh, uh, the New Testament cross-references the Old Testament. But um, each book is separate and unique, and you need to read them that way. And you can't say, oh, well, James meant this because Paul said that. Uh, that's not really a, a legitimate analysis of what is written by each author. And so, uh, you know, I, I've i gone through those books and actually I've, I've started a second book um, that, that I'm going to call One God, One Religion. And I honestly believe you can unite Jews and Catholics and Protestants under one religion. Uh, that may sound far-fetched, but 
look at what, um, you know, you have the Jewish religion established for several thousand years, and then you have a, a split, a, div a division, uh, and primarily it was the Catholic Church that split away from the Jewish religion. You know, not, there were several sects or, or different religions in the meantime, but then you had Martin Luther come along, and he's the father of the Protestant religion. And again, you know, with Calvin uh, uh, helping, you know, kind of cement together some of some of Martin Luther's ideas. But you ask yourself, what divides people into different religions, into different cults or different sects? Uh, it's the it's the Bible that divides people. Uh, you know, you can you can get people that read uh, the part in Matthew where it says you can handle poisonous snakes and drink poison, and uh, and if you have enough faith, God will save you. Well, you, so you've got this sect of uh, of or cult. They're a cult of uh, snake handlers, and what did that sect? or cult base their uh, religion on? They based it on the Bible. The Bible divides people and, and it keeps dividing people. You've got, you know, not just Protestants, but you got Methodist and Episcopalians and, and Baptist. And what a Baptist base their uh, particular church teachings on? Well, it's the baptism that, uh, that John performed. And uh, so, What's dividing people? The Bible. Why should God want us divided into contradictory uh, religions or cults? It just doesn't make any sense. It, it seems like if there's one God, there should be one way to worship him. Or at least, at the very least, some consistency and acceptance across the board, right? Where <laughs> it'd be like, oh, same God, we're cool. Instead, throughout history, you have bloodshed over, like you brought up Baptist. I mean, there was bloodshed over doctrines of baptism, which is, it's kind of mind-blowing to me now to think, like, how you put water on someone's head is 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 so important that people want to kill each other over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Irish, Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants killing each other yeah and a lot of those did have some like political uh, undertones too and and other things going on um but what we're really talking about it right now is, is there's that inconsistency in scripture right and 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 i thank you for acknowledging them it's really refreshing to hear a christian acknowledge that there's inconsistency in scripture um and i read your book and you you do build a pretty convincing argument that at the end of the day, the reason there's inconsistency is you have individual humans writing it over time. You know, why would it be consistent <laughs> that it would almost be crazier if it was consistent? And you're but you're I can tell you're still clearly convinced that God's truth is contained in Scripture. So so where does your faith come from if it doesn't come from the Bible? Is it is it some sort of evidence or experience or can, can you explain where your faith comes from if the if, if you're acknowledging that the Bible is inconsistent? Well, that, that's a great question. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, that, that I'm a scientist, a, a radiation protection specialist, uh, and, and I've got a master's in radiological sciences. And, and one of the things that uh, you have to do to get that is you got to know physics, and you got to know uh, the physics of radiation and, and uh, nuclear physics, and you got to know chemistry because uh, radiation is going to cause chemical changes in things. And so you actually, I was a minor in chemistry in college. And you also have to know biology because uh, the radiation and the chemical changes can, can affect the, the tissues and the organs in the body. And so you have to know a lot about uh, the basic sciences. And one of the things that, that I've observed is that when you look at how atoms are made up, how they're organized, uh, like in the periodic chart, how chemical reactions occur, uh, even down to the, the formation of a water molecule, that uh, if it didn't have the exact um, characteristic that it have uh, that allows ice to float, 
you would have no life on this earth. Um, you know, if all the ice didn't float, and it does because of the crystalline structure of, of, of two hydrogens and an oxygen molecule, all the ice would sink to the bottom of the ocean, and water's a pretty good insulator, and basically all the oceans and would fill up with ice, and there wouldn't be any uh, life on Earth, and lakes too. And uh, so there's, there's that. And, and then the biology, you know, you hear claims that, that people just evolved over billions and billions of years, and calculations show that no matter how long you make the universe, you could not evolve into such a super complex uh, creature as the human body. And that doesn't, evolution doesn't even explain the human mind. Uh, you know, you look at, at lions and tigers and, and all animals, they've been around as long as we have. Why didn't they evolve into intelligent beings? And so everything in science tells you it was designed by a god or someone, I'm calling it God, uh, that was so intelligent, I would say omniscient, all-knowing, and then the creation of the universe to create uh, the, everything out of nothing would have to be God that is all-powerful. And so science it makes my faith rock solid uh, that there is a God and that he has done a, a impossible job from, from a human standpoint, but it's here. You can't deny it. You can't deny the scientific facts that everything is so well designed and works so well and, and even has a shelf life. Yes. But uh, it's just, Miraculous is the only way to put it. And and I don't know if you've had any mir miracles happen in your life. Probably you may not have even noticed them. But uh, the fact that you're here is a miracle uh, in itself. And so uh, that's why more than just uh, having the Bible and the scriptures telling me there's a God, science tells me there is a God. And, and, it, uh, and it's very comforting to know that. Uh, to say the least, and so I'd, I'd, I wish everybody would go out and uh, and get their get an advanced degree in some kind of science, uh, so that they they could appreciate God more. Well, we certainly need more scientists. There's no debating that um, for for many many reasons. Um, can, can I push you a little bit on that and say I'm not really going to argue against intelligent design. Um, I, I I think there's uh, I think it is more compelling than maybe. Um, the mainstream uh um my my view i mean I, you know obviously i i spend a lot of time calling christianity a cult so people might assume i'm just hardcore evolutionist um it's a little more nuanced than that <laughs> in my in my mind yeah. um i think you know i think it, academia can be its own kind of cult sometimes that doesn't really allow um open ended questions and th those are necessary um but but if i could push a little further that's a that's a you know, pretty standard argument for intelligent design, but what makes your faith Christian and not something else? Oh, well, that's a good, good point. I'd, I'd say the main reason is, uh, the book I read, um, uh, by, uh, Lee Strobel, uh, the case for Christ. Uh, when I was doing my, um, uh, analysis of the Bible, you know, back in 1998, I was saying, uh, you know, this is this really true? You know, here we're we're told to worship a man, and that's idolatry. We we can't do that. And so I said, well, you know, there's got to be something that says, uh, you know, whether or not we're supposed to worship Christ as God or not. And uh, and so I I found Lee Strobel's book, uh, The Case for Christ, and and read it a couple of times. And and yes, indeed. Uh, Christ does proclaim that he is God, and that either makes him uh, uh, insane, or, well, a lunatic, uh, or a liar, or, uh, 
for the Lord. And then uh, uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman throws in there uh, a legend. Well, I'd already uh, gone through Lee, Stro <laughs> Lee Strobel's book, and, and he didn't mention a legend. But, uh, yeah, he, he wasn't a liar. Uh, Christ wasn't. He wasn't a lunatic. Uh, because if he was, you know, there, there wouldn't be the Christian religion today. And, and so it pretty much concludes that he was the Lord. He said he was the Lord. Uh, he had miracles that were recorded. Uh, it's recorded that uh, he was resurrected from the dead. Uh, and he resurrected other people. Well, he had miracles, resurrected other people from the dead. And so um, you're left with, I was left with the, the final conclusion. Yes. Jesus is God uh, on earth, uh, incarnate, uh, and and returned back to being God uh, after his resurrection. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll clarify maybe even a little later on. I'm still, I think the only thing I'm missing is just where that faith is. A, is it, is it you've had an experience with Jesus? Is it you're convinced by... Um, you know, the Bible plus science evidence plus other people plus tradition. Like, I, I guess I'm trying to find the equation, like, where are you like, this is why I'm a Christian, especially since you spent so many years um, not being one? Well, yeah, it's it it was uh, my research that led me to the to this conclusion. Um, and in hindsight, I I think I've had a couple of minor miracles happen in my life that uh, helped me convince help convince me that uh, there was a God. Um, one one major one uh, leading to my marriage to my my wife Melissa was um, if if you don't mind uh, my digressing into a, a personal story here. I'd love to hear it if you're willing to share. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, well, we we met. Uh, at a at a nightclub, and uh, really only only talked for about uh, fifteen or twenty minutes. And she gave me her phone number, and I called her up and asked her out on a date. And uh, we went out. Uh, the first date, uh, interesting, was on her birthday, which I had no idea. And uh, so we dated about four or five times. But in the meantime. Uh, my ex-girlfriend who had dumped me, um, we got back together. And uh, so poor Melissa was ignored for uh, several weeks. And uh, I was back together with my old girlfriend, just as happy as I could be. And uh, then she dumped me again. And so I was uh, there without my ex, without Melissa. And I kind of left out one part, sorry, that uh, the last time we met, or Melissa and I were on a date, she was a, a bank examiner, and she said, I'm going down to Laredo to uh, uh, audit a Texas bank. And she said, we can go right across the border and get some get some booze cheap. And she said, uh, what would you like? And said, I don't know. I thought, and I said, a bottle of Kahlua. Right? It sounded good to me. And she said, oh, yeah, it'll be a dollar or two, no problem. And so, uh, yeah, I stopped seeing her. And, and so she was stuck with that bottle of Kahlua that probably cost her $2. And finally, after waiting several weeks, she got up the nerve and called me on the phone and said, John, I have this bottle of Kahlua and you owe me $2. And <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, Melissa, I, I had almost forgotten and uh, so I apologized all over myself and said, I'll take you out to dinner and give you your money. And and uh, so we started dating again. And about uh, after our fourth date after that, this is the only time that this has ever happened to me. Words came out of my mouth. They did not come out of my brain. And I said, you know, we're going to get married. And we had only dated maybe eight times, nine times total, uh, with a long break in between. She was shocked. 
I was even more shocked as to what I had just said. And I even tried to, to crawfish out of it by saying, oh, well, you know, I, I really don't need anybody. I'm independent. I can. And uh, but after those words came out of my mouth and it started sinking in. Yeah, this is the, the woman for me. And we've been happily married uh, 34 years now. Congratulations on that. I uh, I was married and I'm now divorced and I only made it about two. So I know that 34 is not a not an easy streak to hold up. Yeah, well, actually, I can appreciate that because I was married before I, I met Melissa and was long divorced. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I was married a short time and uh, was single for quite a while uh, before I met uh, met Melissa. Yeah. So yeah, I can appreciate that too. Yeah. Uh, it, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. It is tough. Well, I, I appreciate you telling that story. I certainly like point back to kind of moments similar to that when I say like what was ultimately convincing to me when I was a Christian and it, and it, it was experiences, you know, I mean, and, and I don't think that's bad. Like I don't, I'm not knocking it. I think that's like uh, more reasonable than saying, well, it's because the Bible is exact in everything it says. You know, it's more reasonable to say, I've had experiences I can't explain a different way. So that so that, so that makes sense. Um, kind of shifting a little bit back to this whole faith versus works thing. Um, one of the things that's kind of like um, tough is uh, the idea of what good works even means. Um, there's a lot of debates within Christianity about what faith means, but I'm actually more curious about what it means to be a good person. Um, so is the Bible consistent or coherent about what good behavior is? And maybe a more general f- philosophical question, is uh, is morality relative? Oh, yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't think uh, morality is relative. Uh, I think it's black and white in, in, a, in a sense, good or bad. Um, you know, even James says, if you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that's a sin. And and so, yeah, there's and and the Bible is full of, of what is good behavior. Um, and. Uh, for example, in Job. Job has has several parts where he said, well, I I did this and I did this. And and these are the things that a righteous man does. So there is plenty of guidance as to what to do uh, to have good works. And there's equally as much guidance as to what to not do. And and certainly believing in one God is, is what you should do and not believing in false gods, um, you know, Greek mythology gods or, uh, or, you know, Buddhist gods or, or Hindu gods. Uh, those, those are things you don't worship idols. You don't worship money. Uh, you don't, um, you know, talk bad about your neighbors. There are things, you know, don't kill, don't commit adultery. There's a lot of things you don't do, which make you righteous and things that you do uh, that, you know, helping the needy, uh, feeding the hungry, uh, visiting prisoners in prison to raise them up. Uh, there are plenty of things you can do that are are discussed in the Bible and, and uh, can guide you uh, on your path to salvation, to heaven, to get to get you into heaven. What do you do? What do you don't do? It's it's pretty uh pretty clear in my opinion and there's not a, a an area of gray uh, like people like to to say you know well, it's all a, not just black and white it's, no that's that's rationalization people that rationalize um you know their behavior uh, i i've certainly done it uh, i regret it but um i think the bible if you if you take it at at face value, as long as there are no contradictions, uh, that that that's the way to you are given guidance as to what to do and what to not do. Yeah, I I mean where I'm struggling with that is I mean obviously 
the Bible rationalizes itself when it comes to some of the tension between the Old and New Testament. So I won't I won't nitpick there too much because I'm like, well, there's some explanations for why we don't hold to certain Old Testament laws anymore and stuff. So I'm not trying to de- derail the conversation that way. Um, but even 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 when it comes to more general stuff like the Ten Commandments or like things that are still upheld, it seems that um it seems in one point not coveting your neighbor's wife uh might be bad and in other situations you should marry prostitutes and then you go to the new testament it's like be kind to your neighbor here but in another statement (laughs) jesus is calling a you know gentile woman a dog and again I, i i that's a lot of just little examples but that's what I'm trying, I guess, trying to get at. Is there like a consistent good behavior thing that you can point to um, in scripture? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely in Job. Uh, when Job speaks, not as not as three friends or uh, the young man, Elijah. But uh, yeah, and I don't I don't think Jesus called her a dog. I, I think he was saying that dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table and and she was picking up the messages that that other people the pharisees just weren't hearing she was hearing things that that others were not hearing um but let me let me kind of back up a little bit and let's go back to the 10 commandments you know one of god's commandments one of the things that he chiseled in stone with his own hand so to speak twice by the way um were the Ten Commandments, and and if if you look at it that way, those are the only words in the Bible that were written by God. All the other words were written by men. And so, if let's take the commandment, "You shall not kill." Some people say you shall not murder, but I'm gonna I'm gonna call it kill. Uh, and then later on, in the Old Testament, it says you're supposed to stone to death adulterers, and then it comes up again in the New Testament where Jesus says, hey, let's not stone this adulterer to death. Uh, the one of you that's without sin, throw the first stone. And so in in such a, a awesomely intelligent way, uh, God, Jesus, turns over this thing that says in the Old Testament to stone adulterers to death. He says, nope, let's don't stone him to death. So he is contradicting what's in the Old Testament. But stoning adulterers to death is contradictory to you shall not kill. And I I I I think, you know, what what's the what's the takeaway from that? Well, I think the takeaway is the one commandment, you shall not kill, is is the ultimate word of God. And that includes you shall not kill murderers. Uh, capital punishment uh, basically is it's uh, state-sanctioned murder to uh, to kill a killer, and you could incarcerate that person for life, where they never get out and have the chance to murder someone else, and that would be just as effective as terminating their life uh, in contradiction to what the commandment says, you shall not kill. And so, um, and and we could, you know, if you want to throw in that euthanasia, you know, mercy killing is, is probably not something that you should do. You know, God will take that person uh, when he's uh, ready. But, but here's maybe a great place to kind of, I feel, I feel like this is illustrating my point is just then there were some, you know, some controversial things mentioned in your examples, but but that that points to this whole we have such different opinions about morality, regardless of what we believe in Scripture. And then, as you said earlier, when you look in Scripture, what's the number one thing that divides Christians? It's interpretations of Scripture. So, I, again, I'm not necessarily seeing a consistent thing. I mean, I mean, Jesus does a nice thing where he's just like, "Love God, love your neighbors." You know, like let's just simplify it that way. Um, which I, I, I'm in general, I'm pretty comfortable with. Uh, but, but where I'm, where I'm getting uncomfortable is it's just, it's a lot to say, let's have faith, let's have good works. You know, James says you got to have both in order to be, um, a Christian basically. Um, 
but I'm I'm still not sure what good works is according to Christians, especially with all the different interpretations of what good works really means. Mm-hmm. Well, that's uh, in in my opinion what you how you define what these good works are. Uh, one, you start with the Ten Commandments, uh, and if you say you're not to kill, well, then the opposite of that is to help people live. And so that would be good. And, and, you know, it being good is not being sinful. So not killing is good. Uh, And then you'd go to James. And basically, I found it so consistent um, with the Ten Commandments uh, that uh, you get everything you need to know out of out of James, reading the entire book backwards and forwards, and and, and you know that's why I, I wrote my first book, uh, uh, the Bible's hidden treasure, uh, because it does tell us how to live our lives uh, as good, righteous people, and uh, and then I you know you get to Job and you listen to what Job is talking about as being righteous, and and so you get. Uh, you get there and and there you can go through the rest of the Bible and you can find things that are consistent, uh, not contradictory to what's in James and, and the Ten Commandments and, and Job. And you can find out what it is that you need to do uh, to be a to be a righteous person. And it's the righteous person that, that is going to get to stand before God and God's going to say, uh, yep. You've done a good job. You've covered over some of your sins when you were young, and uh, you're you're good enough. Nobody can be perfect like God is perfect. Nobody can be as holy as God is holy, but you can be good enough in His judgment, His perfect judgment, to be able to to stand before Him and in, in, in heaven. I'm gonna. I, I hate to keep keep harping on this. I hope it's not seen as antagonistic. I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. So, like an example is, uh, "You shall not take the Lord's name in vain," or "Remember the Sabbath day." Like two big examples that throughout Christian history, early church, Reformation, Enlightenment, all these different time periods have been interpreted so differently. I mean, um, like I grew up like hearing that "Don't take the name Lord, the Lord's name in vain" meant don't cuss which I can't, I still can't square that circle. Um, And, uh, you know, remember the Sabbath day, Sunday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, you know, which one? Um, And again, I'm not trying to to make fun of it. I'm actually really concerned that if we're going to say the Bible does have a consistent message about what good behavior is, like I'm still confused about what it is, or is it a spirit of the law thing? Is that, is that what's happening? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, the spirit of the law. Uh, yeah, in, in in my book, I talk about the Sabbath. And and basically, I say, you know, pick one day out of seven that you're not working. Uh, you know, some people have to work on the weekends, waiters and, and, uh, and, and medical staff. They've got to have somebody there on Saturday and Sunday. And a lot of people pick that uh, take those two days because they get extra pay that they need. But if they hit, pick their one day off a week, and and I pretty much guarantee you, most of the time uh, people get one to two days off every week, and pick that one day, and that can be your Sabbath. And on that day, you don't uh, go to work for money. You don't hire people to work for you. You don't go out to eat and pay somebody to serve you. Um, So you can have the spirit of the law, uh, a spirit of the commandment uh, as, as, as your goal. Uh, And I I, I think you have a good point. It's the spirit that, that counts. And, and certainly I can't be, the judge of that, uh, I, I'm almost kind of kind of putting words in God's mouth. I feel, but uh, you know, God's going to be the judge, and and certainly you have to 
pray for wisdom. That, that's another point that that I wanted to bring up as to as to why I'm so convinced that uh, to be a Christian is that uh, James says, if you sincerely pray for wisdom, God will give it to anyone. Uh, sinner, uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter who you are, but if you sincerely believe that God will give you wisdom, he will give you get wisdom. And, and when I prayed for wisdom, when I was, uh, studying the Bible and having so much trouble with all the contradictions, uh, I honestly believe God gave me that wisdom, God given wisdom. And, Hopefully, I'm not uh, being blasphemous by saying pick one day of the week that you're going to follow the the fourth commandment uh, in in the way that it's written. You know, it's the longest commandment in in the of the ten, and it says you don't you don't go to work, you don't pay someone else to work for you, you don't have a servant, you don't even work your ox, uh, and and uh, and you and you don't do that within your own town, which is an interesting kind of legal loophole that God put in the commandment because he knows that people are going to go out of town. They're going to go out of town on vacation. They're going to go out of town to work. Uh, and, and so and you're going to have hotel bills and you're going to have uh, to pay somebody to serve you. And yeah, if you do do that on, on let's pick Sunday as your Sabbath, uh, somebody may have, they'll be on vacation, you know, paying a hotel bill on, on Sunday, the Sabbath. And, uh, and the same thing, you know, you may have to travel on Sunday to go to a meeting, uh, you know, out of, out of state or out of, you know, somewhere else that starts on Monday morning. And so, yeah, you're going to pay hotel bills and meals. God in his infinite wisdom, when he wrote those 10 commandments, he was able to foresee uh, all the problems. Yeah, and, and back when he wrote it, you know, people thought, oh, the Sabbath is, you know, the Jews think it's Saturday. Uh, the Christians kind of morphed it and made it into Sunday. Eh, why not uh, pick one day of the week that you don't go to work? And, and that may change every once in a while for a person uh, if their shift rotates or something. But uh you know, it's that one day a week that you pay special attention to God, not pay special attention to yourself. I, I just wanted to chime in and say, this is, again, kind of illustrating the problem, though, because, yeah, one, conventional wisdom just says you need a day off. Actually, <laughs> realistically, research seems to show we need three days off. Um, but <laughs> but right. but but, you know, fine. One day off uh, at least. Right. Um and uh, so we could get that from conventional wisdom or we could get it from a Christian foundation. Um, but I've been to churches that, yeah, they're like Sunday is the day, not Saturday, not Monday. Sunday is a day. I've also um, been to I, I'm familiar with denominations that are uh, really strict about Saturday. Um, and again, these might be interpretation issues that are pretty bad. Um but again, where I get, I guess this actually kind of transitions into where I, where I wonder if a lot of um, these ideas actually come more from tradition than faith. Um, so obviously, beliefs do not come out of a vacuum, um, and neither does our perception of what good behavior is. We all learn, like you know, from the time of infancy, we learn what um, good behavior is and what faith is. And my my biggest argument and why I, I'm passionate about, um, you know, this podcast and other things I do is I would argue that loyalty to any system of beliefs um, and like the type of loyalty that most Christianity seems to demand is is deeply problematic. And it's not necessarily an authentic approach to um, people's faith and practice. So in, in your eyes, what does make um, faith or specifically the Christian faith? and its moral system um, worth caring about. In a world full of toxic Christianity, one man has elected to change everything. What's his name? No, no what's his name? <laughs> oh, it's me. Oh, okay. Yeah, 
I'm John Verner, son of Timothy Verner. <laughs> That's my dad's real name. God help the poor guy. <laughs> I'm just out here trying to tell people Christianity's a cult. Yeah, he is. And he's even written a whole freaking book about it. And now you can read all about his opinions in The Cult of Christianity by John Verner. Yeah, you should go buy my book, guys. It helps me buy Taco Bell. Well, I, I think it has to do with that the, the, the Christian faith um, believes there's an afterlife. Uh, certainly atheists don't believe in an afterlife, but uh, there are plenty of atheists that uh, practice a good moral code. When when you keep in mind that our soul is going to last for eternity, and and the few years that we have on Earth is, is minuscule, insignificant compared to eternity, and our soul is is the Christians believe that that it does last for eternity, and is it going to last for eternity in heaven or in hell? And and I can't judge where somebody's going. God can, and so there there is a a, a God that judges us and determines uh, where we go uh, to spend eternity, and what we'll be doing in in eternity. I, I don't know if we'll be like angels or uh, uh, it'll be one big party, but uh, I, I kind of think. Uh, you know, God puts his angels to work. I, I think he may put uh, souls that reach heaven to, to work also. At least I hope so. I would I would be bored after a, a few weeks of, of partying and uh, being there's an eternity of, of, of what's going to be happening up there. And, and yeah, I want to be busy. I, I like work. Um, I, I like staying busy. I, I think a, a person is incomplete without uh, having a, a purpose and and work to do, uh, if they're able, yeah. It's why why is the Christian religion so important? Well, one, we believe in an afterlife uh, for our soul, while other religions don't, and and I think that's just wrong. Uh, hey, and if I am wrong, uh, you know, there is no afterlife. I won't know the difference. <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to bring that point up specifically because there's the old, you know, Pascal's wager, basically, right? Where it's, uh, you know, if if you believe in, in, in God in order to get into heaven and you're right, score. If you're wrong, well, who cares? I mean, <laughs> you didn't. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but I, I'll push back against the who cares a little bit on that only because I'm like, for, firstly, is your belief in heaven and hell is that primarily sourced from scripture or somewhere else? Well, it is from scripture. Uh, although there was, uh, there was one time where uh, I was going in the wrong direction in my faith. I mean, totally wrong. And uh, I, I, I can only tell you what I felt and, and what I thought, why I was feeling that. And what I felt was a a continual pain in my chest, a, a dull pain, not severe, like a heart attack. But And I don't know if you've ever been lost um, as a child uh, at a department store or a, an amusement park, separated from your parents, and, and you're just terrified. Um, I felt terrified all the time uh, because I was going in the wrong direction. And I, and what I thought was that I had abandoned God. Uh, God was not with me. Uh, you know, I, I wonder about people that go insane, um, that that they've abandoned, or, you know, God's not with them. I, I think if, if God's with you, you're going to be sane and rational. Uh, and it was it was the worst experience of my life, and, and I kind of think that is what hell would be like. Um, there would be no no God in your life because you've rejected God. It's it's an awful awful feeling, 
and it took me uh, several weeks of of. Now, I even had my wife baptize me in a swimming pool, <laughs> trying to get rid of that feeling and and that uh, pressure on my chest. And uh, finally, after uh, uh, a few more weeks, it finally went away. And now, every time I think to myself, "I'm a happy person. Uh, I, I I'm glad I'm alive." Um, I I I. I Swear, God is with me. Uh, swear may not be the right word, but but I just feel it in in my mind and my soul that God is with me, and He was not uh, at that particular time period in my life. And it's not because He rejected me; it's because I rejected Him. And, and again, that was that was a troubling time for me when I was finding all the contradictions in the Bible, and. Uh, and I was, I was looking for all different kinds of ways to figure out what's the right direction here, because uh, I'm not finding it in the Bible right now, uh, until I found uh, James. And then uh, and then kind of the light came on. Okay, yeah, here's here's the way. And I don't, I don't want to nitpick a personal experience ever, but um, I, I just have to clarify. You said you think if God is with you, you'll be sane and rational? Um, in a sense, well, maybe, maybe not sane and rational, but let, let at peace okay. might be a better way. If God is with you, you have a, an inner peace. That makes a lot more sense to me because I was like, I, I think, <laughs> I think I've met plenty of insane, irrational people who who claim God is with them. Um, well, you know that that's one of the things that uh, that Jesus brings up, in, and he says, you know, people are gonna come and say, Lord, Lord. And, you know, they, they're they performing miracles in his name. And and he'll say, I don't know who you are. Um, and and that brings me up to another point that I, that I want to make. And, and that has to deal with strength. Um, and strength is, is something that uh, you have the strength to lift weights or you can have the strength of a bridge to resist failure or resist sin, strength to resist sin and strength to do good actions. Now, I bring up strength because I want to bring up thoughts and faith and belief. Those are things that are in your head and and they have a certain strength. And then the next stronger thing is words that come out of your mouth. And your words can lift people up. They can cut people to pieces. They can be lies that mislead people. Uh, or they can be the truth that guide people on their path. And then the next stronger thing after words, uh, spoken words, are written words. And written words last for millennia, thousands of years. And written words can move people. They can read it, and, and some people can read those those words that are written down and get several different meanings out of it, hopefully all good. Or those words have the strength to turn people to evil. Look at the words of Marx uh, in the Communist Manifesto. He's saying God doesn't exist, and Nietzsche says God doesn't exist. And, and so the written words uh, have even more strength than the spoken words. And interestingly enough, all of the words that Jesus spoke were written by men. Uh, he didn't write one word in the Bible. And then the next thing, stronger than written words, are actions. Um, and, and again, that's a strength, an action to to help someone, help a needy person, feed someone that's hungry, uh, you know, give a coat to somebody that's cold. Donate your unused clothing to goodwill. You're going to help somebody. Those actions are stronger than words. Uh, yeah, you know, and so when it comes to strength, faith is the weakest of those things. And actions or your inactions to resist sins are the strongest things. And I, and I want to present those strongest things to God 
so that he finds me acceptable in his judgment. Interesting uh, kind of pyramid you almost built there. Um, let me. You know, food's at the top. <laughs> food's at the top. Yeah. Um, if I could kind of, I- I'm going to try to apply that grid, actually, and-, and tie it into something I wanted to talk about. You know, I don't identify as a Christian anymore, and I've certainly found um, wisdom and some good principles from certain elements of my Christian upbringing. Um, and I'm not just trying to weigh the good and the bad takeaways, because I think life is more complicated than just, um, you know, w- out- trying to outweigh good and bad. Um, and I'd like to think I'm not just unlucky, <laughs> you know, when it comes to my Christian experiences that have been bad. Um, I feel like I witnessed some pretty typical patterns and factors that indicate a deeply problematic system. Um, so in all of those categories you just laid out, I, I actually find myself to be a better person, the less faith I have. Um, why do you think that's my perception um, or, or how I interpret my experience? I cannot speculate about you personally, but um, first, uh, but let's talk about people in general. Uh, when somebody thinks it's no longer important uh, to think of an an omnipotent God and and, uh, one that won't judge their actions, uh, that can, that can give a person a a feeling of relief saying, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not being judged anymore. God didn't see everything that I'm doing. Uh, But he does if, if you're a Christian. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're saying, Hey, I just don't have to, don't have that pressure uh, of knowing that I'm being watched and judged all the time, and 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 it'll determine my my fate uh, for eternity somewhere down the road after I die, and and so yeah, it, 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 you can feel a, a sense of freedom uh, by setting aside uh, your faith in God. And then there's also a second uh, point that I want to make, and, and that is if a person has less faith, um, they put more faith, uh, less faith in God, they put more faith in themselves. And, and I think this is a good thing, so to speak, because God can give us strength. I mean, he's, he's created us uh, in his image. Uh, we can be strong, we can be wise, we can be intelligent, uh, we can be good, uh, and he gives us freedom of choice, th- thank the Lord, uh, and we can be bad because he gave us freedom of choice. And, and so um, having faith in yourself makes you a stronger person, and I think God wants you to be a strong person, and he, and he wants you to... Uh, try and do things on your own, uh, it's, it's like a parent. When their child finally learns something, uh, does something on their own, feeds themselves, uh, does well in school, uh, you know, whatever it is, the parent, like God, will c- celebrate uh, your having uh, faith in yourself and strengthen yourself. Uh, to be the best you can. Can can I ask a clarifying question there? Yeah. Does God demand dependence from his followers? Well, I I guess if if you say you have he you know his first commandment is there's only one true God. Um and you can't worship uh false gods. Um I guess there there is that demand that you be dependent upon him. Now, that's not to say that you just sit back and and say, hey, God, give me everything. I'm depending on you. Well, no, uh, you know, you got to work to earn your money so you can buy food. Um, and, and so there's there's a trade-off in a sense, uh, or, or two aspects of it. Yeah, you need God. If, if you reject God, um, 
you know, you're, you're, you may still be successful. That's, that's one of the things that's uh, taught in Job. Uh, Job says there are evil people that get wealthy, uh, live a long life, die in bed, just as happy as they can be, uh, even though they rejected God and have done evil things all their life. Uh, Joseph Stalin may be a good example of that, you know, killing millions of uh, his fellow countrymen. Uh, I think he lived to be like uh, 74 or something like that. And, and uh, yeah, he had bodyguards around him all the time, but uh, he was pretty happy, I, I, I assume, uh, being the leader of a nation. Uh, but he was not a good man. Uh, but he lived a long, successful life um, from outward appearances. The clarity I'm seeking is um, what 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 do you get out of the relationship then other than this kind of eternal life thing we've kind of been circling around? Um, because, you know, I'm at a lot personally and, you know, everyone's story is different. So I'm not trying to say my way is right or anything. Um, but personally, I'm at a lot more peace now that I'm not a Christian. Um, so if the thing that's being offered me is eternal peace, I'm like, well, I never had that when I was a Christian. Um, even when I would trick myself into believing I had it, uh, I I know I never had it. And I don't think I'd, I, I personally don't think I'd have it if I came back. Um, so if that's the only thing that's being offered, uh, no thanks. And am I doing anything wrong by saying no thanks? I, I think you're being self-reliant. Um, and I think God wants us to be that. If that gives you peace, certainly God wants us to be at peace, um, and He wants us to be good. You know, I kind of asked the question: uh, You know, what about a Buddhist monk? N- seems to be at peace all the time, um, and they're generous people. You know, loving people. Uh, they're they're doing good. And what happens when a Buddhist monk dies and his soul is uh, freed from his body and the soul looks around, I assume you can see, and uh, at least that's according to some of the near-life stories, uh, or near-death stories, sorry. And, uh, you know, is God going to say to him, hey, you just didn't believe in me or you didn't believe in Jesus Christ? And he says, God, Jesus Christ, never heard of him. <laughs> I've only listened to my Buddhist brother's teachings. And, uh, you know, would God say to him, uh, hey, uh, let me give you a quick lesson about who uh, I am and who Jesus is. And then he says, uh, now that you know that, uh, you've been such a good person, you want to come into heaven? And hopefully he'd say yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't say what God would do, but I can ask myself the questions. What would God do? And say there are several possibilities, uh, infinite possibilities, I guess. And it, it having uh, the characteristics that God wants you to have um, can bring peace and, and satisfaction and I would say, in my personal opinion, not to not to override God, but that would lead to your eternal salvation. So even after coming out with a podcast and a book that calls Christianity a cult, God might be like, "Yeah, no, you you got the gist of it." Yeah, he could, he could. Uh, but I tell you what, you believe sincerely that God will give you the the right answer to your question, I know that God will answer that question with giving you wisdom, uh, wisdom beyond what you can comprehend. It may take time. Uh, one, one little example uh, that I had, a, a miracle, I, I, I guess, is... Uh, I was thinking, well, is Jesus God? And I thought, well, you know, 
if, if Jesus is God, I can, I can think that question and he can read my mind. Uh, and so if I think that question often enough, I'll get an answer. And, and I did. And one day, the second I thought, is Jesus God? There was a guy standing five feet away from me, and he was yelling to someone way down the hallway at work. And he said, absolutely sure. <laughs> he was answering some question to that guy down the hall. He wasn't talking to me. But it was uh, either a, a, a very huge coincidence or what I would call kind of a minor miracle. And uh, it certainly uh, set me back on my heels. <laughs> and so I think if you, if you ask the, the kinds of questions that you're asking, and and believe that God will give them to you, then uh, you will gain in wisdom. Well, you are absolutely free to have that belief. I do not share it. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, hey, give it some time. Well, of course. And like one thing I do try to do is I'm I'm not a closed minded person. I don't uh, I don't I don't see that doing any favors for anyone. Um, being closed minded to all possibilities, which is actually part of my problem with a lot of um, faith based groups. Um, Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, when I criticize Christianity and label specifically white American evangelicalism as a cult, I think the natural inclination is to try to find where it all went wrong. Um, And I'm pretty sure one plot point you might place is, you know, Martin Luther in Germany and the Protestant movement. A lot of things went wrong there. Um, But I think, you know, there's other plot points that are pretty horrifying before the Reformation and after the Reformation. And uh, we're free to, you know, disagree with each other and keep our own. belief or spirituality and and whatever um you know as long as we're (laughs) being nice to each other and have good behavior towards each other um speaking of plot points that lead to cults uh i kind of thought about that a little bit and and i thought well yeah it's been going on since the beginning of time uh we have uh the aztecs and the incas and the uh, hindus and the muslims even uh they are cults that uh, kind of sprung up, so to speak, um, and and they're the wrong cults. Uh, and then you have uh, atheist and communist. Uh, they're a cult uh, that that you know they deny God exists. And there are cults that uh, perform countless uh, man-made rules uh, as what's required to have salvation. And those were the Pharisees. They just you know, and then then you have uh, cults that you know are devil worshippers. Uh, so th- these plot point points in time where where cults have arrived ar- arisen. Uh, oh, another one. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, the Mormons. Uh, they're a cult because they believe that they will become like God. Uh, yeah, that they'll, they'll have their own little world, and and they will be God ruling over that new world, like they like God rules over this world, and uh, and they're falling for the first lie that devil told uh, Eve: if you eat this fruit, you'll become like God. <laughs> so the Mormons are a cult. So there there's these plot points in time that uh, have occurred since the beginning of time, and and are still occurring. Um, uh, even the, you consider the mafia a, as a cult of uh, their criminal uh, organization is one that says, hey, let's don't obey any of the Ten Commandments. Let's kill and uh, do whatever it takes uh, to you know become wealthy. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think uh, Christians are... Uh, well, they they are in a sense, if they if they practice the wrong thing, if their uh, belief is is wrong, like believing that you're saved by faith alone, uh, they are a cult. And, but there are several cults, and uh, you don't have to just pick on the uh, on the on the white Christians as as being a cult because there's there's so many cults. Uh, today and have been in the past that um, if you're doing the wrong thing as a group, yeah, you're a cult. Interesting. Uh, 
I do want to clarify the reason I I make a make a brand <laughs> around um Christianity is not necessarily because I think they're the worst ones. Um, although that they might be depending on you know which day you catch me at. Um, but uh, it's more that they're not typically called a cult. And you said the ones who say they're saved by faith alone in the U.S. at least that's the majority of Christians. Uh, am I wrong in that? Um. Yes, the majority of Protestants, well, all Protestants, and um, now all Catholics, yes, they they believe that, uh, well, the Catholic Church teachings are that you're saved by faith alone now, uh, and it, not, it didn't used to be that way, you know, because they excommunicated Martin Luther for his proclamation, um, and, uh, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, Christians are... Uh, if you define it that way, that uh, they're practicing the wrong faith, yeah, they're a cult. That's just very interesting to me. I mean, I, I obviously agree, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I'm a little shocked. You can, if you don't mind me asking, you don't have to answer. But um, do you are you still a, a church member? Do you go to church regularly? No, I don't. Yeah. So is it for that reason that you feel like you'd be part of a cult in a lot of the time? Um, well, when I go there and and the message is repeatedly, you're saved by faith alone. It just um, I just want to jump up and yell, hey, have you read James? <laughs> and I know I can't do that. Um but uh, yeah, that's that's part of the reason uh, I've I've stopped attending Sunday church. Although I got a lot out of Sunday church and Sunday school, it it can be helpful. But uh, if it's teaching you the wrong thing, and and uh, it can be a, a a bad thing. All right. Uh, w- one more question on that, um, if you don't mind. I know we're running a little over. Um, but. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that I've I've said this many times to I don't know if I've said it on the podcast, but I've said it to friends a lot. And uh, it's that the Christians I get along with the best are the ones who don't go to church. Um, and uh, that's a that's a striking parallel, <laughs> uh, especially yeah. especially because, uh, you know, most churches would say, um, you know, they're very important. They're the primary source of fellowship. They You know, they make these arguments that are compelling and supposedly scripture based that you should be going to church. I, I'm going to read a couple of couple of passages from James about religion. Uh, in James one twenty seven, he says, uh, religion that God our father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Well, look at uh, uh, Joel Olstein's ministry. He pollutes his people by the world. Uh, you know, they're of the world. They're they're not just not in it. And then another one from James is five fourteen. If uh, anyone among you is sick, let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And uh, goes on. I didn't finish it, but it says the. Uh, the prayers of a righteous person are, are very powerful. And in uh, James 5.20, remember, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And so you've got to you know, teach people what the truth is. And not only do you save them, but hey, one of the things I'm trying to do is cover over my multitude of sins, uh, which are, are pretty big, let's, to say the least. But uh, I, I hope and pray that uh, one of these days uh, I'll be able to see God and he'll say, yeah, you did good enough, kid. Come on in. Gotcha. Um, last thing I'll ask, and then we'll, uh, promote your book and get on out of here. Um, so, uh, again, we, we were talking about different cults, you know, you mentioned Mormons and, and Islam and other, other, you know, religions and stuff. And, 
Um, you know, I, again, I I only focus on white American evangelicalism because that's a group I'm very familiar with. You know, I grew up in it, studied in it. Um, so it's not to single them out as the worst or anything like that. But um, as, as someone who doesn't go to church anymore, um, you you but still identify as a Christian, I'm wondering again. You say doing the wrong thing is what distinguishes a cult from genuine Christianity. It's it's that whether you're doing it's basically you're saying their works. <laughs> you're saying what James says, right? You'll know them by their works almost. Um, but I, I still can you can you clarify that issue or, anymore, or do we have to leave it vague and just say kind of what Scripture says, kind of what Jesus says, or is there like a, a clearer indicator of of what genuine Christians look like versus Christian cultists? Whew. Um... Yeah, I, 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 I think what uh, looking at James, you know, I, I, I believe everything that James says is the truth, because it's consistent with other good messages in in the entire Bible, and yeah, a, a good Christian uh, is a person that's uh, loves God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loves their neighbor and goes out of their way to help their neighbor. Uh, you know, Jesus said, uh, did you feed uh, the hungry? You were feeding me. Did you visit the prisoner in prison? You were visiting me. And so if you're, if you're that kind of person, um, then yeah, that's, that's what a true Christian is all about. Uh, helping other people, praying for other people, um, putting other people above yourself. After all, that's what Christ did. And I think Christ was the perfect example for us to follow. Um, and I don't think his his sacrifice on the cross was what gave us salvation. That's That's the one thing that James does not mention. Uh, he does not mention the crucifixion. He does not mention our being uh, washed by the blood of Christ. No, he puts the personal responsibility uh, for our salvation. You know, being personally responsible for a sin is is what God wants. Uh, you look at Adam and Eve when they sinned. Eve blamed the devil. Oh, he lied to me. He tempted me. And then Adam doubled down, doubles down and, and says, um, God, you gave me Eve, and Eve made me eat the apple. It's your fault, huh? <laughs> so they did not take personal responsibility for their actions, uh, their sin. And people that say, Christ died, Christ died for me, all my sins are forgiven. The sins of the world are forgiven. Um, eh, it just doesn't ring true with the way it works uh, with God being the final judge of you personally. And, and so uh, taking personal responsibility is probably one of the characteristics of a good Christian uh, in loving your neighbor is is certainly as important and loving god is certainly as important too awesome well john thank you uh one thing i want to be be very honest about is uh while i i think our faiths and worldviews are pretty far apart one thing i i appreciate is how much value you um put in people's behavior being good um because that's uh again something that seems to be lacking in larger culture and then when you get you know put certain churches under a microscope too um just thanks uh, i i appreciate the work you're doing even if we're not quite eye to eye on everything um where uh where can people find out more about you buy your book uh plug away oh yeah yeah the book is uh the bible's hidden treasure uh, james the precious pearl is the subtitle and you can find it on amazon and uh, you can also find uh an excerpt uh, on Amazon for that book. Uh, you can search for my name, John P. Hagman, or you can uh, look on my website, 
um, uh, it's a secure website. It's uh, James uh, Bible's Hidden Treasure, no no apostrophe there. Uh, dot com, and uh, or search search on my name, John P. Hagman, and uh, you should be able to find it. Uh, what you need. Awesome, and you'll be able to find it in the description of this podcast as well. Uh, yeah, John, thanks for talking with me over this, uh, you know, hour, hour 30 plus. Um, and, uh, it's been a delight and, uh, thank you listener for listening. If you wish to learn more about what's going on in my life or wish to purchase my book, go to the cult of Christianity.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please continue to listen, follow, share, and consider subscribing for additional content. For only five bucks a month, you'll have access to two additional shows, Parsing Propaganda, where I review and critique Christian content, and Art, where we try some amateur religious trauma therapy. Every subscriber becomes a part of something bigger than this podcast as we endeavor to hold churches accountable, speak the truth boldly, and most importantly, love others despite our pain. Thank you for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.